uh, started. Thank you all for staying and uh, braving what is another snowstorm. Uh, my name is uh, Tim McCarthy, and I'm the host and director of the ART of Human Rights, and this is the launch of our spring uh, series. And this is a collaboration between the American Repertory Theater and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School to use art to foster and inspire public conversations about human rights issues and political concerns. And so I am thrilled, thrilled beyond, uh, beyond explanation to be uh, sharing the stage tonight with three folks who need no introduction, but I will just run through them quickly, Eric Foner, uh, who's been described as the uh, nation's uh, finest living historian, uh, Susan Laurie Parks, uh, whose play many of us have just seen and who is, <laughs> who has been described as the finest living playwright, and, yeah. <laughs> and then my dear colleague and former professor, Henry Louis Gates Jr., who one of my students referred to last week as the Oprah of academia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Without the bank account. Right, right. <laughs> So, uh, so it's wonderful to have all of you here. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. So uh, we're going to uh, just have a conversation with the four of us here for a bit, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments from, uh, from the audience here. So thanks so much for being with us. So the first question I want to ask is to Susan Laurie, whose brilliant work we've, we've just witnessed, and to talk a bit about what inspired you to write this play, and at this particular moment, what you see it's sort of offering to the world. Oh, oh I don't know that, the yeah. last one. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'll tell you, tell you about the, sure. you know. <laughs> um, my father was a career army officer. He's passed away. He was a career army officer before he was a professor. And my growing up, uh, if your life is a piece of music, mine is, the recurring motif, right, the, the chorus, of my life, uh, my growing up was my dad going away to war and coming home. He would go away and come back and go away and come back. And the, the story goes, on the day I was born, my dad was out rehearsing for war. <laughs> they called it being in the field, not behind a plow, but in a tank. He was a tank commander, really tall guy, in a tank, um, rehearsing for, you know, doing war exercises. So the title was the beginning of it. And father comes home from the wars, and so I started writing, and um, yeah, other things came. A what lot of other things yes. came, yeah. So one thing that came is that this is set in the midst of the Civil War, right, in and around emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation, and you know, and, and yet it's an epic right. in, in so many ways, and drawing from that tradition, and so, what about the Civil War is you know, a, a fruitful place for you to locate this part of this epic? Um, yeah, I know, I know we're the, I'm aware of the community that I, I am sitting in front of right now. And um, I'm one of those writers who writes and the ideas, if they come, the ideas, the I have something to say about something come phew, much later. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll get you to elaborate more on that in, in another question. Um, so I want to ask uh, Eric and Skip to, to give us your, this is the first time you've both seen this play. You just saw it for the first time and, and have heard about it in various ways. Give me your sort of audience reactions, not necessarily your scholarly reactions or critical reactions, but your audience member reactions. After yeah. Eric. Eric? Well, I mean, I... I, I, I loved it, so congratulations, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating, and I have to say, even though they're not here, the acting was superb, oh, I mean, really, yes. you know, congratulations yes. to the actors. Yes. Um, yes. Um, so, you know, to me, I mean, most of my scholarly work has focused on this question of freedom in one way or another. I, 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 I can't remember them all, but I've written quite a few books with the word free or freedom in the title, freedom, nothing but freedom, free soil, free land. My most recent book, Gateway to Freedom. I've always been very interested in this question of what people think freedom is, how they achieve it, how they struggle to make it mean something, why it's never quite satisfactory in some ways. And um, so you, you know, I, it just, I, I read this play through my own 
interest in that subject. And I think you did a great job of showing the complexities. And it's, you know, freedom is not a simple thing. And even among a slave community of a few people, there's not one idea that everybody shares. Um, there's conflict, there's fear, um, there's struggle. And, um, you know, so I, I just saw it as, I, I think, um, Without uh, being uh, unkind to anyone uh, in the uh, who is a, a movie director or a theater, there's a lot of works which have a historical base, movies or plays which really have no real understanding of the history. But in um, I won't mention any names here, but um, but I think this this really captured something real about that uh, about that moment and about the uh, you know the way people kind of responded to it. So. Um, you know, that, that to me, it, it brought alive things that were real in the history. So it's not a history, it's not a footnoted work of scholarship of history, but there are real insights into history there. So that's what it, that's, you know, that was what impressed me about it. Skip. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, preface my answer with a question by my yes. friend Susie yes. Lord. How many months was Hero gone? How many months? Or yeah. Maybe the actors know. I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, someone count? Oh, Benton. Yay, our hero. 18, 18 months. months. Oh, thank you, Benton. I just want to know who, who the baby daddy was. That's all I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the only one. I was thinking. Well, who's well, baby damn. daddy? Penny's baby daddy? Yeah, you know. And <laughs> if he was going eight months, that could be one baby, one daddy. No, but he was going 18 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, he was gone, yes. More, yeah. than, more than a year. Yeah, yeah there more you than go. A year. Well, oh, he yes. should have killed him. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Skip, it's a human rights panel. We're not going to talk about <laughs> killing people here. I'm a okay. hero on that, right, but anyway, right. no, no. I'm <laughs> um, I love the play. And I love the play because um, far too often, I mean, Eric feels very strongly. Eric and I are very, very good friends. And we have a, a very, uh, a regular email uh, exchange, particularly about things like historical accuracy in feature films. <laughs> He's the historical accuracy and I'm the feature film. <laughs> um, and we, he and I could argue about this all day long. But I've also found that historians often, particularly liberal historians, uh, historians of a left of center bent, often reduce the complexity of African American community in ways that are deeply offensive to me as an African American. And it's not a card I play in public because I don't, you know, when I was coming of age, we were talking about this before, um, I was an undergraduate at Yale between 69 and 73, and it was the time of high essentialism. We didn't even know what the word essentialism was, but we knew that white people weren't supposed to write about black people. <laughs> or if you were black, you had more authority. You know, and other myths like that, claims like that were made, which is just total rubbish. Smart people can master any subject and write about uh, any subject with sympathy. We'll talk about that later. I, no, I've, uh, and I'll, I will argue that uh, till the no, day I, I die. You don't know what I'm going to say. Oh, OK, great. Great. But I also know that um, there were times when historians, particularly white liberal historians, would censor themselves in reaction to this bullying of black militants. So, and I've had friends, not Eric, but I've had friends who were white and prominent historians who would say, no, we can't talk about them in public. Well, it might be true, you can say it, but I can't say it. Or this is what I think in private, but don't quote me, because I don't want to be accused of being a racist. And that's a sad state of affairs. And one area was the, uh, the, black, the role of black uh, people voluntarily and involuntarily in the Confederacy. And it was very easy for people to say, yes, yes, involuntarily, they were slaves, blah, blah, blah. But I also know, just think about it, because of human nature, there had to be somebody black who volunteered to serve in the Confederacy. There just had to be. There were, in the 1860 federal census, there were 4.4 million African Americans. 3.9 million are slaves. 262,000, uh, there are 488,000 who are free. 262,000, okay, more than half, live in the states that become the Confederacy, plus the four border states where slavery remains legal during the Civil War. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Those black people who lived in the Confederacy 
um, weren't, you know, lynched during the Confederacy. I mean, that, they lived under a lot of pressure, I'm sure. But by and large, they were not molested. And in fact, what's curious to me is that in the new episode of, um, you know, my show, Finding Your Roots, I have two African Americans, I can't tell you who, both of whom have free people of color in their ancestry who um, were complicitous with the Confederacy. One was a blacksmith who did regular business with the Confederacy, and we showed her, we turned the page, and I showed her a receipt from the Confederate Army for fixing a wagon. And then I set her up by saying, I'm sure they made him do it, I'm sure it was, it was only once. Then we turned the page to like five more receipts. <laughs> you know, this guy who had a regular, regular business. And the other one was the valet to the man who was the senator from South Carolina and then the governor, the richest man in South Carolina. They went to Canada. His valet later said that he was ambushed by abolitionists. The senator, the rich, you know, senator, governor, rich white man from South Carolina, looks all over for him, goes to Boston. They can't find him, so he goes to Boston. Two weeks later, the valet comes back, apologizes, and said he'd rather be a slave in South Carolina in the big house than free and homeless and poor in Canada. These are two stories that actually happened. So all of this is to say thank you, right on. It will open a big discussion. And John Stauffer, my colleague at Harvard in American Studies and in English and African American Studies, just published a great essay on how many uh, black people, it, he's concluded, voluntarily um, served in the Confederacy. And it's about 3,000, just over 3,000 mm -hmm. people. And I encourage you all to read it on, on theroot.com. You give complexity to the black experience that is very important. And you're opening a debate. And I applaud you for it. So I want to I want to ask him because we were talking about this on the way over from the airport uh, this morning about this debate that's reemerged over Black Confederates, and I see on the one side what you're what you seem to be saying is that there's a need for any of us who are doing this work, certainly as scholars, to 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 sort of work out the complexity of this history, right? That there's yes. a need for us not to oversimplify. In or any, censor or, yourself. Right, or, or censor yourself, right. And I, I absolutely see that. But I'm also wondering, like, what is at stake in this new debate about how many people who were African Americans served in the Confederacy? And to, to, to parse that out, what does it mean to serve in the Confederacy? Like we know the stories of the Massachusetts 54th. We know the stories of African American soldiers on the Union side and sort of what their service looked like. And so what's at stake in this debate? Well, you know, it, it, the, the, in a way, you got to elevate the question to what is at stake anyway in talking about the Civil War? What is at stake in talking about slavery? Which is still an uncomfortable subject for many, many people to talk about. You can, you know, um, and, and what is at stake if to say slavery was the fundamental cause of the Civil War? Which I find, when I say that in lectures around, I find there's a lot of resistance to that. Nobody alive today owned a slave in the United States, right? Nobody alive today was a slave. No one is being accused of anything personally. Nonetheless, there are people who find it a kind of personal affront if you say the Civil War was fundamentally fought over slavery. Now, there is no question, as Skip said, of course, when you're four million or more people, that you're gonna have a tremendous range of ideas, of, 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 respo of, of responses to the war. Um, the notion that some uh, black people in the South identify the Confederacy should not surprise anyone. There were black people who served in the police in South Africa. There were, blacks, there were slaves who fought for the British in the wars of the Caribbean. Uh, th this is not something that is unusual there were Jews complicit us with the Nazis. Yeah, in, uh, complicit. But I think, uh, but the um, on the other hand, one has to push back. If you go to the internet, which doesn't always give you the correct information, you will find websites devoted to legions, imagined legions of black Confederates, mm -hmm. thousands upon thousands of them. Uh, it, it's sort of to demonstrate that the Confederacy was sort of a multicultural paradise. Right. <laughs> and that, in, no, and that indeed, then, and that in fact it was less racist than the North. Right. There was certainly plenty of racism in the North, obviously, but, uh, you know, the, the sort of historical defense of the Confederacy has now taken on a new, um, 
you know, an, an, a new language. It, 50, 60 years ago, it was people didn't mind defending slavery in a certain way. Now you sort of can't do that anymore. So the Confederacy is seen as a, so the black soldiers represent the good race relations of the Old South and of the Confederacy. I, as, as scholars, we have to do the research and decide what, right. what it is. Stauffer puts, I mean, I have to say, Stauffer, don't take this wrong, is a professor of literature. We won't tell him. And as a, as a historian, I find the evidence that he puts forward, uh, let us say, suggestive but not uh, conclusive in many ways. It's reminiscences and other things. But nonetheless, the fact is that the Confeder it, there is no question that some small number of African Americans did volunteer and probably served in Confederate armies. No question about that. Mm. On the other hand, the Confederacy as a government was very resistant to enrolling blacks in the army all the way through until the very, yeah. very, very end of the war when they finally said, okay, we're gonna, we're in this desperate state. Right. But the point is, yes, we have to separate this history from you know, uh, current politics in a sense, at least at the beginning, to try to figure out what is the real, to say no black person in the South could have possibly identified with the, with the Confederate cause is absurd. On the other hand, the, one has to kind of distinguish between the, you know, distinguish the particular anecdotal event and the kind of center of gravity. And there's no question that the center of gravity among the slave communities in the South was sympathy for the North, desire for Northern victory, um, desire for freedom, as you show. So, um, you know, it's, it's a his, it should remain a historical debate, but as you say, there's, a, there's layers and layers of uh, emotion and politics, uh, you know, layered onto it. Right. No, Eric's absolutely right, that there are <clears throat> Confederate organizations that have claimed tens of thousands of black yeah. men fought for the Confederacy, but this is rubbish. But a few thousand did, mm -hmm. and, okay. uh, and I'll accept that. Right. That's right. enough complexity for me. Right. Yeah. Interestingly enough, another <laughs> fact that's important is that what do we estimate about 500,000 black people um, were freed by the Emancipation Procl Proclamation, right? right? Which means that they ran away or were able to get behind Union lines after the Union soldiers liberated the areas in which they lived, which is what the Emancipation Proclamation was all about. Um, you, you accept that figure? Skip, Skip and I don't agree about the Emancipation Proclamation. I don't know if this is the place to have that debate. Let's go. But, uh, <laughs> but you got to tell them what the positions are. <laughs> uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think this is the place for that debate. <laughs> okay. uh, what, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery, but I, right. my, my position is it, it changed the character of the war, the war and made the death of slavery inevitable if the Union won the war. If the Confederacy won the war, slavery would have existed for a long, long time. No question about sure. that. But, I agree with that. But the number, to say the number freed by the proclamation is, I think, uh, open, open to dispute. I would put the number considerably higher than that. That's yeah, all. I wouldn't. All right. All right, so Susan Laurie. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I know, should yeah. about, because um, mm -hmm. you, you both are talking about using the word complexity. And I think um, when we look back into history, where the kind of history where, as you said, none of us actually lived. Um, and we look around us here and all over the world today, the notion of um, the idea of complexity and the other are things that are very hard to bring together. It is very hard, mm -hmm. in my experience, for m most of us to imagine the other and complexity. The other is that one, those people who do that. Um, and even sometimes in our own community, you know, we like to see ourselves. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been asked the question, what do black people think about? Eh. Right. You know, I mean, we laugh, ha, ha, but the question is asked often. Mm -hmm. And so it is hard for us to imagine complexity mm -hmm. today. And it would also, I think, be hard to imagine complexity back then. Um, we are not, uh, we do not practice that often enough, I think. <laughs> However, I would, oh, let me just, as a historian, complexity is essential, but it is not an interpretation. In other words, you can't just that, that, you can't just say, well, my view of the Civil War era is it was complex. That's not sufficient, at least for a historian. You know, then you have to, as I said, say, well, what is the main tendency? Mm -hmm. 
not the 100% tendency, not that every single person, but what is the main tendency that's going on? That's what the historian has to uh, uncover. Uh, complexity is, a treme is, is important to remember, but it is not sufficient as an explanation of what was going on. I mean, there's more, inter there's more interest in complexion than there is in complexity. Mm. Um, you know, the one drop, oh, that's very interesting, but we don't really look at the one drop in terms of opinion um, when it comes to looking at ourselves and looking at the other. And that's one thing that does, I think, go on in the play. Yeah. There are a lot of people thinking a lot of different things about mm -hmm. the same thing, apparently. Well, I, I wanted to ask you a question about about hero, both the character and the the archetype, right? That you're that that he contains multitudes, right? He he's constantly shifting and changing and containing all these things, that not always at the same time, but it's revealed. He, I think, one of the things that's brilliant about the play is that he always enter. He's the sort of center of the play in so many ways, but yet at the same time, he only appears halfway through each of the parts, right? He's only he sort of emerges, and 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 there are all of these reveals, right, as the play goes on. And in a sense, what I guess the question I have for you is. Does this play have a hero? Is hero that play? And is, are you actually creating complexity in, in that archetype, right? This play is, I mean, he's named hero. He could be seen as such. He's tragic. He's flawed. He contains multitudes. Are you trying to push against that notion that we need heroes or heroines in, the, in these stories? A lovely question. I'm just showing him. Mm. I mean, he's, his name is hero. But as we find out in part two, his first master only called him Joe. Right. Mm -hmm. He decides to name himself Ulysses, mm -hmm. putting him square in the sights of the greatest man of the moment to mm -hmm. him, and in the, you know, right in the bullseye of the historical or the you know literary historical Ulysses, who comes home and kills people. Darn. Mm -hmm. You know. So I'm just. I'm just, I'm one of those writers, who, there are lots of writers who have these ideas, they're gonna subvert them. Yeah, yeah. And there are writers <laughs> like me who, who, I have something, I have someone that, I'm, that I love and I want to show you what he's like. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. that, okay, all right, mm -hmm. good. Skip, it's up now. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to ask a question that you'll answer in public, which is, Yes, which is uh, about your relationship to Greek tragedy oh. and to Greek myth, mm -hmm. right? So, so why, why cite it? Yeah. Um, why use these archetypes? And some of the, some of the figures are very consistent with Greek mythology, and some of them aren't. Curiously enough. So, so why why sort of borrow or? Yeah. The, ah, I love. I'm I so mean, happy that you answered that. Ulysses' question. wife is was famously yes faithful. Yes. Unlike yes. A hero's wife. Yes. Or well, the, well she was fam fa faithful in her mind. She Look was at that true. Woman that, well. She was true. She was true. There's honest, true, and faithful. Oh, okay. Hero is honest. He exists in the framework mm -hmm. as a good guy. Penny is true. Mm -hmm. Homer is true. True North. The dog, the dog is, is faithful. The dog is faithful. Yeah. The love that passeth understanding. That's, that's the dog. But that's the, dog the dog says, I have no choice. It's part of my DNA. That's what, but that's, you know, he is called by a power that is, is greater than himself, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but, but why do I follow the Greeks? I laugh when you ask that because, yes, because I, I love them. And because they're in the groundwater, mm -hmm. much like the Civil War for um, most Americans, mm -hmm. much like who's the name of Hero's new, what's the name of Hero's new wife? This is the question I love. Yes, and who has a wife, a new girlfriend whose name is Alberta also? Ever heard of a play called Fences? Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, and when I wrote that I was like, oh shit. <laughs> it's so in it's so woven into the groundwater of my personal mm -hmm. cultural experience mm -hmm. that when the guy whose name is Troy comes home right. he's got a wife named he's got a new gal named <laughs> Alberta That's funny. Dang. And that's how that's how woven that's how thickly enmeshed in the shit we are up in it so bad. That's called intertextuality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where it's my day job. 
I can, prefer can, enmeshed can, in the shit, actually. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm, I'm curious, actually, since the, the, the Greek mythology is uh, built in, um, what kind of, to write this, what kind of like historical research or reading, if any, did you do? I'm just I've read I've read some of your books. No, I'm, I'm not long. looking for that. Really I mean, did you sit down and start reading all sorts of works? She read the short say, history you know, of reconstruction. No, but, no, uh, I actually yeah. read that's a lot of words, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, that's too I, late a period. It's the, no, no, yes, exactly. But no, I I I I've, I've been re writing about this period for for a while. So I have a cum I mean, I've written a lot about uh, Lincoln. Lincoln and linking and how he links, you mm -hmm. know, and I went off on that for a long time. Um so I've been reading a lot about this period for quite a while, but at the same time, you break free and suddenly you're running down the road because what I wanted to capture is not what had already been written, but the thing I was hearing, those voices that are beyond. And so uh, I have a, a great respect for you know, historians and history and wonderful works of literature and scholarship. And also we need to you know, that's freedom. Talk about freedom. Mm -hmm. It's true. You know, it's, um, and it's something in our arguments that I, I insist on, which is the freedom of the artist, artists to take historical facts and ignore them. Right. You know, it's called art, not history. Right. I completely and, and we have to do that. I completely look, agree, Skip, Skip, as long as they don't claim it's history like some people do. Oh. If, it's, if it's art, if it's theater, absolutely, perfect, novels. Right. But some of these folks, unnamed, go out and say, this is real history. I'm giving it into the schools. I want it into the oh, history classes. Oh, yeah, well, that's classes. wrong. And I'm with you on that. Right. But I'm talking about feature films or, or yeah. plays. Yeah. I mean, after all, this very much reminds me of um, the first time. And I hadn't read the play. It's the first time I saw it because I wanted to react spontaneously. And I love your work. I knew I'd love it. Um, the first time I read Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. How many of you have read Their Eyes Are Watching God? Mm -hmm. OK, a lot of people. So I'm reading along, I'm 27 years old, 26 years old, I'm a new professor, I mean with <laughs> exaggerate quotation marks, I'm a lecturer convertible, it's called, <laughs> haven't finished my PhD. And um, one of my students says, you need to read there, I said, why don't you go? We need to teach this at a little tiny seminar. Nobody knew who I was, I wasn't anybody. And she, it was out of print, so she gave me a Xerox, so I, I read it. And I'm reading, and it's like realistic, realistic, realistic. Then you get to this point where the buzzards start to talk. You know, buzzards like buzzards. Mm -hmm. And there's a mock eulogy, and then the buzzards do a mock mock eulogy, which is now, like, what the hell kind of book is this? <laughs> I had a similar experience on the stage here, I mean, in the audience, when the dog talks. And I, I thought, well, if there's anybody who thinks that this play is tied to historical reality, now they know that it's not. <laughs> and I like that. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so is that, is, this, is that the explanation of the dog in the play? Because I'm waiting for one. No, I don't have one. Oh, I'm okay. just saying that no one could, could yes, make yes. the mistake of saying right. that this is masking itself off as, right. as history. Right. Um, no, but I'm with you in, in terms of a, curric a history but curriculum. Has to be, right. if I may, yeah. you know, subject to evidence. You can't right. just make it up. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that this is very much on my mind because of Selma. Mm -hmm. I, am, I think what's happened, what historians have done to Ava DuVernay yeah. is just is horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a play about Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson's a big guy. Lyndon Johnson could take care of himself. There's a whole Lyndon Johnson industry. <laughs> and when, as soon as people say, what will the children think? I think, didn't that happen in Athens? You know, right. a guy walking around and they made him drink hemlock because they said, what will, the children think, <laughs> what will the children think if they listen to Socrates? Are you kidding? Nobody's going to see Selman learn about Lyndon Johnson for Christ's sake. But people have just tried to tear this poor woman apart. And I happen to love it. And as a scholar, I'm, I have a, a BA only in history. I'm not a professor of history. I'm proudly a professor of English. But I do write a lot about film and I even make films myself. And there is a difference between making a documentary and making a feature film. Right, right. And if the, there's a beautiful essay that is a total deconstruction of the imitation game. If you've seen the imitation, I love the imitation game. I like Benedict Cumberbatch. I went home and read this essay. It's like, it didn't happen, or it didn't happen this way. But nobody is trying to keep that, that um, imitation game from winning an Academy Award, right. which they did for Ava DuVernay. 
And it's just not right. And I, I was so glad when you did Top Dog that you didn't have that Lincoln industry on your, you know, your, uh, on your, uh, on your head <laughs> because you got the facts wrong. You know, it's, it's not your job to read the but facts. But there's, is, I mean, this is one facts. thing that drives me nuts about the, the, the role of the public historian as fact checker for cultural productions. Right. Right? That, that there's got to be a more useful role for historians to play yes. in the world than to say, Amen. well, Lyndon Johnson took two bathroom breaks during that time yeah, that he was on the phone with those three senators. And maybe it was two senators. I mean, it seems to me that there's a more robust and interesting role for historians to play in the public sphere when it comes to debating these things. And one of the things, and I, so Skip, I agree with you very much so, but yet what is the role of the historian then when these kinds of historically themed art forms emerge, right? When a play like this comes, when anything that you do comes along, when, when Selma comes along, when 12 Years a Slave comes along, when these sort of artistic forms are generating and catalyze, catalyzing fierce historical debates, what is the role for historians to play? And what's the role for historians to play in conversation and debate with the artists themselves, okay. right? Which is, we well, have I think, just, I think what is, I, I agree. I don't think the job of historians is to just say this, this little conversation right. didn't happen that way or this uh, didn't happen on that day. Obviously, the artist, the filmmaker, the playwright has the right of creative you know, invention and that, that's, that's the genre. But I do think we should say, and this is, I like Selma a lot and I think the critique of the treatment of Johnson is a complete red herring. But I think there's something, of course the play doesn't, fall into this trap at all, but there is something about Hollywood history which always tends to go to the great man. I don't care whether it's yes. Gandhi, Malcolm X, Lincoln, or even in this movie in Selma, you know, King, yes, what I like about the movie is that it gives you James Bevel and it gives you some of the others who are unknown today, but it's still King really as sure. the, you know, the, the real catalyst of the movement. I think that's just that's in the DNA of Hollywood, that yes. you've got to have, and it's always a great man. Is there any woman one can think of who's had a movie like that? I can't think of one. Margaret Thatcher. Mike Margaret Thatcher. Thatcher, all right, you can have her. Um, <laughs> but um, I think we do have a responsibility to say, I'm, I'm not talking about individual thing, but a, a, a movement, a, a, something like emancipation, something like the civil rights movement is not the work of one person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, well, but yeah, let me take ahead. a crack, if I may. Um, the role of the historian, to be a consultant, mm -hmm. first of all, any smart director mm -hmm. will anticipate the criticism of the, of the, the public historian, as you put it, mm -hmm. by incorporating them in, in the game plan. In the process. And academics are so cheap, it's not like a big investment, right? <laughs> I mean, we, you know. so, <laughs> Free tickets, yeah, right? 200 right. bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't they you know, find out and so that they know and then say, and then they can be proactive, say, look, I knew this, and that way they won't be defensive. Because I think they were caught off guard. And then they were defensive. Yeah, and then that created, the narrative began to spin out of control. Mm -hmm. But in the end, um, no, the, the creative writer is not obligated to get the facts historically right. right. It's a different genre. And Eric, I was so pleased when you wrote me that email. And, um, and I told people, I said, ask Foner. You know, Foner and I agreed for once. Finally, you know? no. agree a lot of the time. I know I'm being. I was thinking funny. also about it, 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 it. You said Hollywood is the, goes to the you know the, the the big one, the big man, or the big moment. But um, it used to be that that in theater the stories were also going to the big one. I mean, you think of the Greeks, you think of Shakespeare, and it wasn't really until we started getting you know beautiful plays like I don't know like Death of a Salesman. You know, a salesman was the hero really, and I just take it the next step where my hero is someone you've never heard of. And I would, in your presence, say, it feels like it happened. I mean, not like Brian Williams, bless his heart, but it, <laughs> it feels like it, but oh. it feels like, I'm sorry, but it feels like it, it feels like it happened, meaning um, there is so much of African-American history that is unrecorded. It just, these people in this play, the majority of them, cannot write, mm -hmm. cannot read, they didn't, you know, they, a hero uh, is excited about telling his story to his children, mm -hmm. the bits and pieces of story that my father told me about his experience in the war. He was a career army officer, okay? 
years went by and he said nothing. Yeah. One day I said, finally, Dad, what was it like? And again, he's 6'4", and he curls himself up like this, and he just looks at me. And that was all he said about his service, because that's what it was like for him, 6'4", riding around in a tank. That was it. So the stories were told. So, you know, but that's anyway. also a metaphor. Well, mm -hmm. the fetal kind of yeah, position. Yeah, I mean, well, it had to be, he, he had to have moments like that. Well, yeah, but um, what I'm saying is it wasn't written down in a document that could be stumbled upon by somebody and then published and called history. Yes. Right. So much of it is unknown. Mm -hmm. So this history that we're seeing here, and I talk about it a lot in some essays that I've written, I'm making history. Right. Yes. Right. Making it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it read, but it read true. What you said is absolutely true. Yeah, that it, I, I mean, read true metaphorically. It sounded true. I mean, it 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 was very very convincing to me. And something about the tragic hero, mm -hmm. which I think it's important to say. First of all, you gave him a capitalized hero identity, ironically enough. So he's supposed to be an every man, as it were, every person. But you went back to the tradition and made him. The hero, which is what the hero is. A hero is the hero, right? And then who has to have the fall? But I would say, as you know, a student of tragedy, uh, and tragedy is one of my favorite genres. I mean, at Cambridge, where I went to graduate school, you had to read three papers. They were called, and tragedy was one of them. Um, though the Greeks and Shakespeare did uh, had royal protagonists, so that you had to have a, a noble person to have a huge fall, they weren't real people. You know what I mean? I mean, nobody, you would not read Hamlet to get an idea about the succession of Danish princes for an anthropological mm -hmm. paper. You know, you just don't. They were, they, you knew that they were allegories, fictional, or what, use whatever word that you, that what you wanted. So I never took them as historical personages. I, I took them as excuses almost, you know, as a, a literary license. So it didn't matter to me that Arthur Miller made the salesman as, I know it, it mattered in the history of, of theater, but it didn't matter on, a, on another level. But what you do is to go back and take an every man and elevate him and, and give him a noble status within your play. And he has a great fall, but he's, he's fallen. To, uh, talk about that for a minute. You know, this is not a guy who's up here and then has a hubristic moment and then falls. Right. He's very compromised from the very beginning. But he also rises and falls continually throughout the play as he comes and goes, right? Mm -hmm. So he's yeah. not someone who, who has one trajectory, either up right. or down, right? right. He, keeps, he keeps moving. I know. I mean, that's why that's... I, and yet I, doesn't. Well, but he, he, well, he follows the brightest star right. that he knows, right. who happens to be a person named the Colonel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he has at high noon in the second play, I, what I consider to be the best moment of his life, he stands there with that rope the end of the rope, mm -hmm. and he decides not to follow that course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for one brief second, and we've all had this in our lives, for mm -hmm. one brief second he decides give, he can free a man. Mm -hmm. And then in the next second he cannot free himself. And then he can tell a story about it, which becomes either a well, it, well, or it, Exactly, the, the dog doesn't right. believe him. The dog right. even doesn't believe him. Right. It, 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 it <laughs> happens. <laughs> Nobody's right. going to believe him. Right? Even faithfulness has its limits, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll follow you, but I'm not going to yeah. buy everything. You know. And that's yeah. the, the, the. I want to get back. You mentioned uh, I'm waiting for someone to analyze the dog, and I, I mean, I think the dog does exactly what you did at the beginning, right? There are three sort of. I mean, there's lots of stuff you're working out here, but it seems that the, the truth, the honesty, and the faithfulness. That right. without the dog, you can't parse out the distinctions, even when they're the blurriest in the play. You can't actually parse out all three of those things without his faithfulness, right? And and but yet at the same time, the the faithfulness of loyalty, right? Of the faithfulness of, of a dog to a man or a dog to an owner or however you're gonna conceive it, is also at the same time doing what Skip said, which is to say, look, signal to the audience, this is not faithful to reality. <laughs> Right, that the dog is is faithful to hero, but is not faithful to reality, and that's 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 the role that it. You like that? You like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like you intended that, and uh, but I want to I want to ask ask you a, a question, then I want to then I want to open it up to the to the crowd, um, and this gets at a little bit of what Eric was talking about at the very beginning about freedom, right? Freedom is a word, if there's a word cloud for this play, freedom and or free is is has a significant place in the center, and. And I can't help but ask myself, and then I want to ask all of you, who's free? 
right? Is anyone free in this play? And what contribution is this play or these three parts of this larger epic and uh, 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 nine part series, um, what contribution is it making to our debates about what it means to be free? Who's free in this play? Oh, you know, I used to think the dog was free, but then um, he's just the first runaway of the play. Right. In part, before part one, right. as you're gathering into your seats, he's running. Um, you know, Homer's free until he falls in love with Penny. Mm. And then he's not free. He's tied. Right. Penny's not free. She's in love and mm. with two men. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't know. The, the colonel is free because he's dead. That's what the missus says. He's not free. He can't imagine his life without a hero. And he also is, feels free because he believes so deeply in the fiction of whiteness. He's well, he's, he's so not fear. free. Right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, bless his heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bless his heart, right. well, as they say in the South. Yeah, 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 well, yeah exactly, yeah. right? No, he's hopelessly right. enslaved. Totally. Right. Yeah. right. He's, like, he's like Hegel's essay of lordship and bondage. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I thought of. I thought of yeah. what you were reading is yeah. of the, the way that, it, it, in case you haven't read it haven't. recently, but it's, <laughs> it just says that the status of the master is dependent on the status of the slave. Right. That both, neither is free. That they're both slaves. They're equally free and equally enslaved. They, you, need, uh, you can't be a master unless you have a slave. And you right. can't be a slave unless you have a master. Right. 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 So that's what that means. Right. It, it, what interests me is how, and uh, in, in the writing of history lately, there's been a kind of tendency to uh, not exactly denigrate, but to de-emphasize freedom mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, more scholars now, I mean. That's because you used it up with yeah. all those books you wrote about freedom. <laughs> Go, go back to... Uh, Nobody can write about it anymore. <laughs> he got the Pulitzer Prize. They, they right tried, they tried. Go back to John Hope Franklin, you know, from slavery to freedom. Right, right, that, right. that was a pretty clear trajectory. Yeah. You know. 1948. Yeah, 1948. Well, but a lot of but that was a story which was right. very easy to understand. Yes. Right? But today, a lot of, you know, you have books about the limits of freedom, the failure of freedom. Right. I think it's, I think our views of freedom in the past are often you know, are shaped by what's going on today. When people are disappointed, as they are today, mm -hmm. yeah. they look back and they say, things didn't quite work out the way right. we expected, you know? Mm -hmm. So whether it's the results of the civil rights movement or the results of the civil war, mm -hmm. freedom didn't quite become the utopian thing that many people hoped it would. Mm -hmm. um, but what I like about the play is that you have a lot of different views of freedom in there, and, 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 but you do not succumb to what some historians, I think, do is just saying, well, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. You know, it, and that between and freedom ridiculous. and slavery, there's no difference. Right. right. Which is not true. Which well, is in, your book, in your book, Nothing But Freedom, you talk about that. You say right. that they had nothing but freedom, but freedom was not nothing. Oh, no, it's right. huge. Yeah. But um, I think um, mm. the freest moment to me in the play, and I'd have to see it again, but as of right now, is when the old man renounces the boy that he loves. Oh, that's, yeah. that's the moment of freedom. Because he turns on him, and you think he's going to be loyal to him. He's going along with this story, and whatever he says, he's going, yes, that's right, yes, that's right. But as soon as he finds out that he's betrayed um, Homer, right, he turns on him, right? Yes. And yeah. that, to me, shows that the old man is free, you know, yeah. that he has, he does have principles. He does have values. Mm -hmm. And even if this boy that he loves, mm -hmm. as much as if he were his own son, Betrayed right. those principles, right. he cuts them off, and I, I admired that. I liked. Yeah. It. Yeah. yeah, but at the end, he's sitting on the porch saying, "You know, right. it's he lose, He does renounce. He does come out. He is free." And then he says, "He promised he'd come home. With luck, it won't be long." Mm -hmm. And I just know that he's still tied to sure. him. And you know, right? He's mm -hmm. not a son anymore, mm -hmm. but he's sitting right. there hoping that he'll return soon. Right. Which mm -hmm. is just adds another layer loving. to yes. the right, the thing. Yeah. But you're right. I think you're right. I think the old man yeah. is the. But again, this, the runaways ask in, the, in part three, you know, where is freedom really? Will the air smell sweet? Will the streets be paved with gold? Will there be a, le a bed to lay my freedom head? Will there be food? Um, will I say at the end of the day, God, I wish I'd stayed home? Yes. Which mm. is, yeah. Yeah, but that's beautiful. Yeah. But you know, the, um, yeah. and Eric will give us the statistics, but I remember when, no, and I meant that in a, you know, in a very admiring way. The, um, the, um, I'm very interested, the irony of doing black genealogy, if you're descended from slaves, well, we're all descended from slaves, but remember those stats I gave you at the top. 
So in 1860, 12% about of the black community is free. Mm -hmm. So if, if you know where, if you're, you descend from people who are free, it's easier to do your family tree because they're in the census and they're legal people. And mm -hmm. by definition, being legal means you have a name and it's written down, you pay taxes, right. um, you pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the irony of being able to do black genealogy if you're descended from people who weren't free until the 13th Amendment is that you need to find the white person who owned your ancestors. That's the only way you can do black genealogy back before the Civil War. So that what you're hoping, if you're me, is that you, you, in, what you, all black people are in the 1870 census for the first time with two names, right? Because that's five years after the end of the Civil War. So you find them, let's say Oprah, we found Constantine Winfrey living in Atala County in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So then you go back to 1860 census, hoping some white man named Winfrey mm -hmm. owned a plantation mm -hmm. and who owned a male slave 10 years younger than this black Constantine Winfrey, who you happen to know is Oprah's ancestor. And not only did we find that, but he's living next door to the white man who owned the slave tenure, Ab uh, Absalom Winfrey. Mm -hmm. So it's what I'm fascinated by is this notion of freedom and naming. Mm -hmm. All this was a preface to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is how many black people, mm -hmm. the percentage of black people who took the name of their owner. Because mm -hmm. at different points in the historiography, and I'm always fascinated by the waves of history. They're fads for historians. Mm -hmm. um, there's at one moment it was thought that the slaves just took the names of the masters. Then another moment that no, the slaves rejected them. And another moment, they all went to the north. I mean, no one seriously believes that. But the truth is, most of the slaves um, maybe walked off the plantation they were on mm -hmm. and turned around and came back. Mm -hmm. There was a great deal of stability mm -hmm. uh, after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And in, I teach, in a class I teach, there's an essay published in a special issue of the North American Review in 1884. It's like on the Negro. And this guy predicts that the South will soon be black. It's a white sociologist, right? I mean, it's a proto, but slightly before sociologists embedded. But he's given us the statistics and said, these are really black states. And these Negroes are never going to move. If they didn't move before the Civil War, you know, after the Civil War, they are never going to move. And, the, the, and then six years later, the Great Migration the starts. All I'm saying is that, so I want to know if, despite the horrors of slavery, isn't it true that most of the former slaves stayed where they were, more or less. Pretty much, or nearby, anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, no, they wanted to be, as, as we know, when, you know, when people asked about 40 acres and a mule and everything, this was not out in Nebraska or you know, the Homestead Act. They wanted land where they were. Right. Their communities were rooted there. Um, the guys in South Carolina with their petitions said that. We want land where we are living right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, I mean, and, and to, to go to the north was not exactly a great option at that time since there were very few jobs available for blacks mm -hmm. in the north. No, the question after the Civil War was what kind of rights and power and recognition they would have in the places where they were living. That was what the battle was over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because you think, Jesus, you know, yeah. if you're Jewish, are you going to go back to Germany? You know, I mean, this is like a horrific kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they, that's what they did. And, the, and today we stay in relationships that are less than perfect and we stay in jobs that are less than great and we can understand that. That's the thing, we, we understand and we can have a compassion for people who don't get up and go, you should leave, you know, well, you know, they were human. And that's the thing about, I would say, that, that is my, one of my charges as an artist. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, the only way that I'm interested really in addressing what people call the race question or whatever mm -hmm. is just reminding people that my people are people. Yes. And under that comes everything. Mm -hmm. But at, at, at that you excel. And that's why you not only deserve one Pulitzer Prize, you deserve another one as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that's great. Let's open it up for questions from all of you. So do we have... Share. Oh. 
we're going to we'll share. share. I'll share. Well, we can share. Okay, we'll share. In a, okay, so raise your hand, identify yourself, and ask a uh, fairly succinct question. Okay, right here. Thank you. Um, my name is David Rubin, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, just do a quick comment and then a question. The, the comment is that in, in some ways, um, I, I, find, I found the most uh, compelling thing about Hero was that he, he wasn't a volunteer. He didn't do it out of, he didn't join the Confederate forces out of any idea of service to that cause. He, he was trapped, basically, in a set of uh, survival uh, questions. And I thought you brought that out very beautifully painfully, but very well. It reminded me a little bit of Mother Courage, the uh, Brecht play, and, and this, uh, I, th I think one of the things you're doing, which, which I value a great deal, is that you're bringing back the teaching theater, I mean, part of Brecht's idea, the didactic theater, uh, and, and by distancing, uh, the, the action as you do, connecting it in so many ways with, with, with myth and, and li other literary echoes, I think really accomplishes that. The question is, uh, at the end of the play, uh, I had at least in the back of my mind that uh, Hero was uh, testing Penny, Penelope, uh, with the, the idea that he had a second wife and, and a, uh, another life. Uh, and not, I don't hear that in the, in the conversation, but I wasn't, I, she never appears, so there's no, there, there's no dramatic part to that. And I, I'm not sure how, that, how well that actually works, if, if I might be so bold. Uh, but I wonder what you had in mind, because uh, the, the, the Odyssey was, was rattling around in my mind, uh, and, but I don't think to any, any real purpose, and I'm not, I don't think you had it in mind. Sure, uh, just th thank you for, for your comments. Um, Alberta, well, it, parts one, two, and three, and parts four through nine are coming. That's the, that's the short answer. And she is real. She's and again, you know, she borrows her name. The, the groundwater, the, the the funny referent that I could not escape, um, is fences where Alberta does not appear. You know, um, so there's a lot of there. There's that the misses the misses they speak of yeah. never appears either. Yet she is real up at the house. So there's a lot of borrowing from the Greeks, a lot of things that happen or are happening off stage that we do not see, you know, right away. So it's, it's really in that tradition that I'm, that I'm, that I'm resting in. Other comments, questions? It's hard to see. Right here. I was surprised that people didn't say the union, the black union soldier was free. What'd you say? Yeah. I hear. I'm what? surprised that none of you mentioned the black Union soldiers being free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Smith. I know. I know. Blackish. What well, one of the? Uh, <laughs> but see, this is what this is why I asked you about yeah. what you were reading because uh, everybody's heard, especially in this town, of the 54th Massachusetts, 55th, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Very few scholars even know about the Kansas yes. colored, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. unit. So yeah. why did you pick on that one as uh, just to, to be, you know, to identify that soldier? Is that a right. in Kansas? Is, uh, and, and yeah, it, it was just, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was just, I didn't want to choose one that was already done, you know, in some movie about something. And it was, again, it's like this is, in a an historical moment that we're all you know somewhat knowledgeable of, but it wasn't again. It wasn't like I wasn't going in. The second play is called A Battle in the Wilderness and not The Battle of the Wilderness. You know, so it's intentionally not 
Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, but in terms of, of, of Smith being being free, it, it's 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 funny. Um, he he is he is. I, I would I would say he is, and he's. Um, I, I love him very much. He's on fire. He has Pentecost happening, and um, yeah, I, I love him very much. And I think I think you're right. I think he is a free man of color. Yes. Can I ask yes, you? Please. Did you start with? I was thinking. Well, the obvious question: Why did she make him able, capable of passing? Right. So then, did, did you start with the the character who was uh, capable of passing? Or did you start with the situation and then say, well, the only way this would work is to have a black man who looks white? Because obviously, the boss, master boss, would have killed him, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, it started actually, that's a great question. It started with the two coats. Yeah. And if you just, oh, do you one more thing to throw into it? So I wrote part three first mm -hmm. at, the, at the public theater, you know, and that's where the whole play's been developed um, in association with ART. And they wanted to produce part three by itself. And I said, no, I have to write more because I knew it was a nine part play. They said, well, we'll go forward. Next play is Penny in the Wilderness or what, you know, with the baby and then Albert and, and Hero at home because his name was only Hero then. And I said, no, the next parts come before. I have to go backwards because I need to know where Hero got his two coats. So it started with the two coats and asking, where did you get your coat? That tall, tall tail? Yeah, right. The dog in me wanted to know the story. And so it went backwards into the coats. And yes, the only person who could pull off that was someone who could pass, like so many people in our families can like, whoa, pass, but chose not to and blah, blah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, that's interesting. Other, yeah, up there. Abby Wolf. Abby. Hi, I'm Abby Wolf. Hello, Hi, friends Abby. on the stage. Um, <laughs> I have a question about one of the most powerful moments in the play I thought was the hands up, don't shoot yeah. part. Um, and the way that that made the play resonate with, if it hadn't already, the way it resonated with things going on today. But that brings me to a question about costuming. Um, I was, this might seem like a minor question, but I was a little bit thrown off at the beginning in the first part by the Crocs, the old man wears Crocs. Um, the, one of the less desirable slaves wears Timberlands. Penny's shirt looks like it comes from Forever 21. So I'm just wondering where, you know, if, I'm assuming it's intentional, but what was, what was the And then all the runaways have that? sneakers on. Yes, this, exactly, the right, and the sneakers at the end, right, the black sneakers with the white yeah, threads. And, the white yeah, and one of the undesirable, less than desirable says snap. Yeah. Right, yeah, sure. right, so it's right embedded in the language. Mm -hmm. And Isosa, who did the costumes, totally picked up on that. He also, we also worked together for Porgy and Bess and Top Dog Underdog. But here we really, uh, he really picked up on the fact that, whoa, this is now. Right. This is then, this is now, this is then, this is now. And so he, he, he you know, worked with us to, to put in some contemporary references. And the way it lined up with the events of the day, right. uh, from the hands up to to make it possible so I could find a way to breathe, mm -hmm. to Control. even on a personal note. My, I had a son who died at an early age with something that actually happened uh, at the public theater um, with one of our colleagues. So it just lined up in a, it kept lining up with now. In a right, right. You, you. Didn't need, you didn't need the Crocs for people to understand it was now. Yeah. You know that, right? Well, I didn't do the costumes. I, I share, you know, I share the, the process with my mm -hmm. colleagues. Mm -hmm. One of the other things, too, in terms of the resonance, I mean, it's unmistakable, the hands up, don't shoot, right? And the, yeah. the comments about the patrolmen and when, you know, when we're free, will we be able to say, you know, we're here and we're free and we're not going to get shot, right? All of that is so resonant. And but one of the other things, too, that struck me as being quite resonant with this play is the fact that we never see war. Right, that one of my students, I think last week, made some comment about how they're very happy that, to be studying the Civil War in such a way that isn't just about white boys on battlefields. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at African American perspectives and women's perspectives and all these different ways to think about the war. And one of the things that I um, 
always loved about August Wilson's work is that so often the white people aren't on stage, right? They're, they're referred to, right? And the, and the systems of oppression and the people who are at, in control of those things are often off stage. And it seems to me the war is always there, right? And all of the violence in the play, the physical violence is truncated or aborted, right? There, there's almost a stabbing, there's almost a shooting, there's almost a whipping, right? There, well, there, 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 was one, there was one striking, yeah. No, that's, Right, right, the foot, exactly. So much of the violence is suggested and it, and it appears, it's performed, and then it, 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 almost all of it is sort of held back. And yet, to me, that resonates so powerfully with right now. When I mean, we're at war, a world at war, we're a nation that's been at war for most of my students' lifetimes. I mean, this is a war generation. And yet, most Americans have no connection to the war, no connection to the violence, no connection to the trauma. And it's striking to me how personal and also how profound that that representation of the Civil War is, where you never see a battlefield. And yet violence is absolutely pervasive to the system of slavery, to their lives, to the way that they are bound to each other and bound. Uh, was that something you were intending? Is that something that you, you mean, did I write a battle scene and then cut yeah. it? Down? No, no, no. Did oh, you I'm did sorry. are you are you are, are you making a larger commentary on the, the sort of pervasiveness of violence that is often sort of out there? It's always there and yet it's it's suggestive well, in some way. Well, so many way. of my plays, yeah. are, and so many of the yeah. things I write, novels, songs, everything, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the, the impact, father comes home from right. the wars. Right. So it's, it's the, the, what happens in the home, in the community, yeah. you know. Um, it's a relationship. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where, because that's the thing that most of us, even if we do have, mm -hmm service people in our family, you know. But yeah. that's the, the thing that most of us are dealing with on a day-to-day. -day. That's the thing, yeah. That's we right. can't go over and solve the issues right. of the, the, the crisis, but we are dealing with somebody at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I, Skip. I, I found one scene very violent. Yeah. Uh, to be locked in a cage right. yeah. is an act of violence. Mm. And I found that an actualization, as it were, of violence. Yeah. It's very subtle. But horrible if you think about it. I mean, and the guy's bleeding to death and he's gonna lose his leg maybe and because right. um, it's gonna be gangrenous. Um, so anyway, that's my only thing. Right. And that's also the part where, where the colonel horrific. does strike hero, right? Where there is where that violence occurs too, and there's this there's, yeah, absolutely. We have time for one or two more questions. Right here. Hi, um, my name's Sophie. I uh, first just wanted to thank you so much. I saw the play on Thursday and thought it was absolutely incredible. Um, and one thing that I experienced was uh, just feeling like my expectations were uh, really confounded. I, I think I didn't realize that I had expectations for the, what the play was until I was watching it and realizing that none of them were being met. And I think part of it was um, I, well, I, I studied history here um, under Professor McCarthy, and I think I became really comfortable with the genre of slave narratives and came to expect things from it. And um, mm -hmm. having, a, at, for one thing, a character who often is a hero, and then having a narrative that has to do with escape and freedom. And of course, there's uh, diversity within different slave narratives, but I hadn't realized how much I, that was. there was an expectation for me about what um, representations huh. or narratives of this period in history were like until all of a sudden I was watching something that didn't obey any of those. Huh. Um, huh. So that was one of the most amazing experiences for me in watching this play was having all those expectations upset and I'm just wondering if, uh, I'm not sure if you, if you sense people's expectations in writing this kind of thing or if you ever had expectations yourself for what, for a play of this period following that certain format. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering if you'd speak That's to that. That's a, such a, a wonderful comment. I, I've, I've really never thought about that. I've read, of course, plenty of, of, of slave right. narratives and, uh, and respect them tremendously. But it is, um, yeah, they do follow a, a form. And it, they were written in a certain time where there were tremendous expectations. Um, and... 
Yes. I didn't want to see. I was like saying, I, yes, 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 that's right. yes, yes, yes. And um, again, this is to break free of the traditional narrative and to say we have a hero who does not follow the hero's journey or here is a hero's journey too just to put him alongside of all those other heroes and heroines is a way to be free in our and and then take it home in your own life you know what i mean we have expectations and we have narratives and we have things put on us and to find ways in which you can be of service and be free at the same time mm. yeah I think that's a good place to, to end. Let me just, a uh, couple of uh, quick announcements. One is that the ART of Human Rights series will continue on throughout the spring. There's also a new initiative uh, that Skip is part of, that I'm part of, that Eric Foner and Susan Laurie and so many people in this room are part of, that Harvard is going to have a whole series of events around commemorating, interrogating, uh, the Civil War, and it's the Harvard Civil War Project. The Office of Fine Arts uh, has put together all of the list of everything that we know that's happening starting now through the spring. And so if you go to the Office of Fine Arts website and look for the Harvard Civil War Project, there are literally dozens of things that are going on on Harvard's campus throughout the semester. And uh, Skip? And uh, Eric Foner. Uh, yes. came not only for this discussion, but he will be giving That's right. the first of three lectures uh, in, in a lecture series um, Monday, uh, tomorrow Monday, and then he'll be lecturing on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, so please, please come. It'll be in the Thompson Room in the Barker Center, which is uh, 12 Quincy Street at 4 o'clock, okay. 4 o'clock tomorrow. So please come. He's a, you know, he's a, not only is he a dear friend, but he's a great scholar and he's a magnificent lecturer. He's pretty smart. Yeah, yeah so it's gonna yeah. be a real, real treat. He was my dissertation advisor, pretty smart guy. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.